In the vivid reality of Miami, Florida, a haunting tale emerges. The Chilling Chronicle of Lolita and Hugo. Once captives at the Miami Sequarium, these magnificent creatures grapple with a life of captivity as their natural excitement was dampened by the harsh confines of their enclosure. Join us in unraveling the dark and unsettling journey that led these orcas down a foreboding path, haunted by the echoes of their captive past. Freedom for a killer well in captivity is among the sweetest gifts in the world. That's what Lolita sensed when she retired from performing at the Sequarium in Miami. The world's oldest captive orca lived for 57 years in a small tank at Sequarium, but now the world wanted her freed. For some years now, Lolita has been miserable. She lost her mate, her beloved Hugo, and with him no more, Lolita was hanging on the edge. She had no children and could no longer come to terms. But suddenly, in 2022, it was decided that Lolita had earned her freedom. She was to be transferred to a massive whale sanctuary. But that day would never come, and Lolita would never see the open ocean again. In August of 2023, the alien orca passed away. This is the story of Lolita, a dark tale of an elderly orca who lived to be among the loneliest in captivity. It all goes back to 1967, to the beautiful waters of Puget Sound, where Lolita and her mother lived as resident whales. Puget Sound might look like an ocean paradise, but it was also the happy hunting grounds of the orca boogeyman, Ted Griffin. Griffin was a notorious poacher skilled in capturing and selling juvenile orcas to aquariums in Europe and the US. Lolita was only six years old when Griffin and his team captured her, along with several other juvenile whales after Griffin herded them into Penn Cove, Winby Island. Whale captures are bloody affairs, often ending in the death of orcas, especially the mothers fighting to protect their babies. Lolita's capture was no better. Using speed bolts and bombs like M80, Griffin's team surrounded the whales with nets. It was a violent capture with some orcas fighting to resist. Eventually, four juveniles and one adult were killed in the melee. 80 orcas were captured that day in an operation called Namu Incorporated, Lolita was one of them. The gruesome incident stirred many animal activists, especially when three of the carcasses washed up on the shore of Winby Island on November 18, 1970. A legal suit against SeaWorld six years later ended in a settlement, and the company agreed to never again capture orcas in Washington state to avoid publicly taking the blame. Lolita wasn't her original name at the time. She was first named Toki, and she was quite large for her size. For Griffin, that meant loads of cash. At 14 feet long, Lolita was perfect for the regular sized tanks in a marine park. On September 24, 1970, Lolita was sold to Sequarium veterinarian Jesse White for a whopping $20,000 and was sent to Sequarium, Miami, where she met Hugo for the first time. Hugo was a giant boarding orca bull who wasn't doing well, though Sequarium thought a mate would do him some good. Lolita's story is intertwined with Hugo's because both got on well together, a reprieve and distraction from their living hell. Hugo's story was no less tragic than Lolita's. Captured in 1968 in equally violent circumstances, Hugo was packed off to the Sequarium, where he lived in a pen a little bigger than himself. When Lolita arrived, she was half the size of Hugo, who measured 22 feet long and weighed 12,000 pounds. Hugo detested his captivity and often rebelled against trainers and refused food, frequently showed aggression, and often tried to harm himself by bashing his head against the wall of the tank. In 1980, Hugo succumbed to self-inflicted torture and created headlines as an orca who took his own life. If at all Hugo lived in brief happiness, it was because of the bond he shared with Lolita. When two orcas from different pods meet, they may not always become friends. There was a risk that Lolita might get aggressive against Hugo, so she was housed in a separate tank adjacent to him. Sequarium felt it was better for the two to get acquainted at first, and they weren't exactly pinning their hopes on the two bonding. Lolita lived in the Whale Bowl, a tank that measured 80 feet by 35 feet and 20 feet deep. But now it would suffice for Lolita, but once she grew to her full length, the Whale Bowl would turn into more of a sardine can for her. It was a huge surprise when Lolita and Hugo began bonding within a few days. Soon, 
Trainers began hearing wails and sounds, a sign that the two orcas were communicating. Both Lolita and Hugo began calling out to each other every night, perhaps from a perspective of solidarity. Somehow, the orcas might have just realized how they were in the same predicament and were consoling each other. One reminded the other of their family and friends free in the ocean. For the next 10 years, Hugo and Lolita became the best of friends. In fact, Lolita might have just been the solace that a depressive Hugo needed. The duo trained together and even performed together, but to say they were happy would not be entirely accurate. After all, both were in a prison. They were far away from the sights and sounds of the ocean, and if you think they enjoyed their performances, you have another thing coming. You see, performing orcas have no option but to obey the cues and commands of a trainer during a performance. They have been trained to do so, and not always is the training ideal for a monstrous-sized animal like a killer whale. Hugo had lived in Sequoia much before Lolita, so he turned out to be a depressive, suicidal animal. When Lolita arrived, the first few weeks may not have been so bad. With Hugo by her side, she might have thought, okay, let's get used to it. I have a friend. It would be all right. Until, of course, training began. Training a large killer whale goes one of two ways. Obey and get rewarded, or disobey and get punished. An uncooperative killer whale was often prodded and deprived of food. Punishments sometimes extend to depriving an entire team of orcas for the fault of one. This bizarre method would result in the battering and bullying of the guilty orca, but it was a guilty form of coercion that marine parks used all the time. While Hugo remained rebellious, Lolita proved more cooperative. Perhaps it was the presence of Hugo that helped Lolita forget about her depression. In fact, she might have even looked forward to performing with Hugo. The thought of jumping out of the water, swimming at high speeds, and performing tricks might have given a brief reprieve to her captivity. It might have even forget that she was in a tank, but instead, in the ocean with her mate by her side. Lolita was considered a courageous and gentle animal. She even showered affection on some of her trainers and throughout her existence, did not even once attack a human. The same cannot be said for other famous killer whales in captivity. Hugo, Tilikum, and Katsaka are names that will go down in history as examples of why such magnificent beasts belong in the ocean. In his lifetime, Tilikum killed three people, and Katsaka had attacked many. No, it was never their fault. The same could not be said for Lolita. She was the sweetest and often showed affection to humans. On March 3, 1980, Lolita's Hugo was no more. The orca's constant self-battering finally took its toll, and he finally succumbed to a major brain aneurysm. Experts attributed his behavior to suicidal psychosis, often seen in captive whales. The death of Hugo made several animal rights groups, including PETA, sit up and take notice. Hugo's demise gave birth to the rise of Friends of Lolita. The movement was born and kept up its momentum for three decades. Lolita just had to be freed. With her precious Hugo gone, Lolita sank into a depression. Her trainers noticed a marked change in her behavior. She ate less and no longer showed the same enthusiasm. After Hugo's death, Lolita shared her tank with a short-beaked common dolphin and a pilot whale. However, there were no consultation for Lolita, who missed Hugo terribly. Lolita kept on performing for Sequarium until 2021, when new hope dawned for her eventual release. Sequarium was purchased by the Dolphin Company, and simultaneously an order was passed by the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, prohibiting Lolita and her dolphin companions from public displays and stage shows. Lolita was retired. It seemed the future was bright for Lolita and her release was imminent. The dolphin company would even
An aquatic celebrity who attracted thousands of admirers from all over the U.S. suddenly ends his own life, leaving everyone in shock. The death of Hugo, the killer orca, is one of many incidents that highlights the psychological torture mammals face in captivity and how their suffering is glorified in the aquarium industry. But who was Hugo, the killer orca, and what were the reasons that led to him ending his own life? It was the year 1965 when Hugo, a majestic southern resident killer whale, took his very first breath in the vast and mysterious ocean. Just like his family, Hugo spent his days gracefully traversing the waters, skillfully hunting for food alongside his devoted family. But little did he know, his life was about to take a devastating turn. Fast forward to 1968, Hugo's world was shattered. In Vaughan Bay, Washington, his days of freedom came to a heart-wrenching end. He was captured, torn away from everything he had ever known. Imagine being only three years old and being forcibly separated from your loved ones, transported over 3,000 miles away to a place unknown. That was Hugo's tragic reality. This aquarium in Florida became his new home, a concrete prison they called the Celebrity Bowl. In this confined space, Hugo's magnificent body was trapped, only a fraction of his immense size able to be submerged in the water. Isolated from the outside world, he became nothing more than a spectacle, a mere source of profit for the aquarium. However, amidst the bleakness, there was one man who refused to accept this mistreatment. Richard O'Berry, a former trainer of Hugo, witnessed the pitiful scene firsthand. In his book, Behind the Dolphin's Smile, O'Berry vividly describes the heartache. When I fed Hugo, his tail would be lying on the bottom and his head would be completely out of the water. It was pathetic. They wanted me to train him. I refused and left in disgust. Yet, in the midst of Hugo's despair, fate had another twist in store. A glimmer of hope emerged in the form of a new companion named Lolita. Like Hugo, she too had suffered a tragic fate, losing all of her family members to ruthless hunters. And so her path led her to the aquarium, where she found herself sharing the same stage as Hugo. But their initial introduction wasn't immediate kept in separate tanks preventing any potential conflicts. The two orcas called out to each other during the lonely nights, yearning for connection. Their sorrowful cries echoed throughout the walls, an undeniable testament to their longing for companionship. Recognizing the undeniable bond between these two remarkable creatures, the aquarium's managers made a bold decision. They reunited Hugo and Lolita in a new tank, hoping for a positive outcome, and to everyone's amazement, the two orcas thrived together. It was a fresh start for Hugo, a chance to rediscover happiness and find solace in the companionship that he so desperately craved. Hugo and Lolita quickly became the stars of this aquarium. Their awe-inspiring performances captivated the hearts of thousands who flocked from far and wide to witness their magnificent displays. Television ads showcased their incredible bond, enticing people to experience their beauty firsthand. Yet, Behind the gleeful images projected in those advertisements, a heartbreaking reality looked beneath the surface. The whales, despite the smiles they wore for the audience, were suffering. Their lives offstage were consumed by misery, hidden behind a facade of entertainment. As time went on, more and more spectators came to witness the amazing orcas and their performances, but things weren't looking so good for Hugo as the longer he stayed in captivity the quicker his sanity degraded. Hugo began developing a habit of ramming his head against the tank walls, which seemed like a quirky habit for outsiders, but was actually an indication of Hugo's patience running out. As days went by, Hugo started to lose control over his impulses and began to act violently towards the trainers of this aquarium. In 1970, during a rehearsal, a trainer stuck his head inside Hugo's mouth, which was already a bad idea. But to his surprise, Hugo bit down and lethally injured him, which resulted in the trainer getting 10 stitches in his head and neck. Just like his behavior, Hugo's aggressive habits became volatile as well. In 1971, an incident occurred where Hugo broke a hole in the plastic window of his orca tank and severed the tip of his nose. It was concluded that the incident occurred due to Hugo's habit of ramming his head against the tank walls. Hugo was taken to a vet and his skin piece was reattached but within a week it came off. As a result, Hugo bore a permanent small depression on the tip of his nose 
that he would have for the remainder of his lifetime. As years went by, Hugo's self-destructive behaviors kept on growing. As in 1972, a Sequarium trainer, Max Jax, reported that Hugo had caused harm to many people by forcefully bumping into them with his head whenever he became irritated. Several other trainers also attested to Hugo's tendency to behave aggressively and initiate attacks against the aquarium staff members. One unfortunate individual even sustained a permanent scar on their arm as a result of an encounter with the whale. It seemed like Lolita's presence could not prevent Hugo from losing his sanity and harming others. Even though Hugo showed clear signs of hostility towards the staff of this aquarium, they were not going to let him go that easily as he and Lolita were the stars of the show that brought in thousands of dollars weekly, making management wealthy beyond their wildest dreams, but their greed sacrificed the health of their animals as Hugo's sanity was lost with time. The animals that were once meant to explore the open seas were now being held captive for their entire lives inside a concrete pool for others' entertainment. It was a fate worse than death, and soon it would lead to the demise of poor young Hugo. Soon, tragedy was going to strike faster than anyone could have imagined, as Hugo's self-destructive behavior was soon going to decide his fate. At the beginning of 1980, Hugo was acting sluggishly and began facing fatigue, but no medical examination took place as an animal's health was not a priority back then. Even in his suffering, he was not being noticed by the staff. According to them, Hugo was looking fine and healthy. They carried on with his usual training routines but this carelessness from the staff would eventually result in lethal consequences. Soon, the adored star of this aquarium was going to make headlines for all the wrong reasons, as years of self-destructive behavior finally caught up to young Hugo, eventually leading him towards his death. On March 4, 1980, Hugo and Lolita were rehearsing their stunts for an opening event on the same day, but it seemed like the curtain for Hugo was closing even before he could become part of the spotlight. Hugo stopped moving completely, and floated above the water like a wooden plank for quite some time. The trainers called out to Hugo multiple times to move and even threw bait towards his way to get a reaction. They thought Hugo must have gone under a half brain sleep, but even after multiple tries, they could get no response from him. Upon closer inspection, they realized that the young orca had passed away. Many that came to make joyful memories were welcomed with sadness, as hundreds of spectators saw the lifeless body of the beloved star being hoisted out of his tank. Hugo's death left everyone in shock, but unlike everyone else, the Sequarium resumed the show as if nothing had happened. During an autopsy, it was revealed that Hugo died due to brain aneurysm. For some, it was proof that Hugo's death was due to his habit of thrashing against the tank walls. Following his passing, Hugo's body was discreetly disposed of at an undisclosed location. Many claimed that the management of the Sequarium dumped Hugo's body in the local landfill, but these were mere speculations made by people enraged at the management's mistreatment of the animal. After Hugo's death, everything went back to normal and the show carried on without him. Lolita would later do all the performances by herself, entertaining crowds of hundreds that had no idea what the orc was actually feeling deep down inside. For Lolita, Hugo was the only friend she had since her captivity. With him gone, she was once again alone, swimming in circles in a concrete pool with no freedom in sight. Hugo wasn't the only whale to show hostility towards his captors. Throughout the 1960s and 1990s, there had been many incidents of captive killer whales attacking aquarium staff members from all over the globe, and even killing some in the process. For instance, killer whales like Lupa, Tilikum, and Cuddles all showed a familiar pattern of aggression and rebellion against people while being in captivity. As the trend towards aquarium kept on increasing over the years, so did reports of captive orcas attacking creating a debate among activists about whether or not these behaviors are a result of orcas fighting for their freedom. Rebellious orcas aren't the only issue here, as there have been many reports of young orcas dying due to multiple reasons, but the majority of the cases point towards the lack of facilities that the aquariums had. Many activists have highlighted the fact that aquariums collect aquatic life in large quantities without even assessing their capabilities first. During a USDA audit conducted in 2017, it was discovered that the tank housing Lolita failed to meet the size criteria mandated by federal law, which validated the activist's criticism. By looking into the history of Hugo and Lolita, we wonder, 
Will the Sequarium ever be held accountable for the mistreatment of animals such as Hugo? Will animals like Lolita ever get the freedom they deserve? We may never know, but remember that there were other orcas that also suffered the same way that Hugo did.